Let me introduce myself. My name is Attila Pók. I am a historian, and uh, in addition to working for the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, I also have the honor of being a senior researcher at IASC. So I got the task of moderating this uh, concluding discussion, I mean concluding for today. I think the system we are going to follow is that first we are going to give the opportunity to the speakers and the new participants in this roundtable discussion to make short statements, because what I heard is that some of you prepared with some short statements. Is that the case? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, so let us first hear the short statement, uh, and afterward, afterwards we might be opening up for questions and discussions. In principle, we are expected to work for an hour or so, but as far as I know, the next item on our agenda is visiting the museum in this building, which would only start at uh, short after six, uh, so those who have the energy and the willingness and uh, the wisdom to extend the discussion, then you are welcome to do so. So we are not so under terrible time constraint. So I think then perhaps we could start with those who have not spoken yet, with the short statement, and perhaps with the ladies first system, right? The normative? <laughs> Okay, I, I think there is an interference happening yeah. quite badly at the moment. Oh. Now? It's okay. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for having me, and I would like to thank all the previous presenters today for their um, interesting talks. My name is Astrea Pejovic. I'm a PhD candidate at Central European University here in Budapest. Not for a long time anymore, as you are probably all very much informed or not. So uh, as an anthropologist, um, basically uh, I within our discipline, we like to think a lot about temporality. And uh, I was really triggered by this idea of uh, thinking about future of democracy and uh, challenging democracy as an idea very much, but not challenging future as an idea or as a trope that much. So. Um, I Hence, I would like to comment on the idea of future. So uh, as how I see future, and you can challenge that later, that future is basically a product of our capacities of imagination, and that uh, different trajectories that all of us obtain, as we saw, especially in the previous panel when we heard uh, ideas from sociology, political science, and then from economy in so it was kind of touching a lot, but then it, it, uh, it provided us with some um, quite different ideas of, of present, basically. So um, I believe that um, different trajectory very much influence um, how we imagine different futures. And uh, how those trajectories are formed is a very much question of our formative experiences in education and uh, especially during education in terms of quality of knowledge that we obtain at our universities. So uh, my question therefore would be how is future of democracy tied to academic freedom today? And what is the role of academia in overcoming challenges? And what is the role of academia in constructing those both on the level of idea and on the other hand of, on the level of practice? And how are we, um, what is the meaning of freedom of education for tying academy, um, knowledge and practice? So I would be very close, uh, short and that's Three, it. I'm also going to try to be short as possible. Uh, I'll try to just raise some questions. I thank you very much for your presentations. I enjoyed all, all, all of them. Uh, I pretty much 
have to agree with what you have offered, but of course I feel that there are some questions that were not addressed. Uh, but of course this is probably because of the lack of the time. I'm First of all, I'm not sure if the populism is a new phenomenon, because uh, we have parties in Italy, in France, like Front National and Liga, Lega Norte, which has changed its name many times already, and this is an old phenomenon. If you also look outside of Europe, we have uh, populisms with Getulio Vargas and uh, Domingo Perón in Argentina and Brazil, respectively. And of course, we have uh, Syriza now in Greece, which is not so new, because if we think it just kind of came as a replacement of PASOK, which was there before. So this is my first question, because also we have People's Party in, in the United States, which was absorbed by the, by the Democratic Party in its own time. So it seems that this phenomenon seems to be appearing, and it's related to this question of uh, popular sovereignty in Rousseauian terms more than in others, and it's somehow also related to this main rule of democracy, the majority principle. And it seems to me that what with populism, and uh, I don't have any normative preferences, even though I do not support many of the leaders that emerge, it seems that we have this thing that Muda seems to be proposing, that we have this pathological normalcy, basically occurring, which is not normal pathology, which happens with fascism uh, during the in this interregnum uh, between the First and the Second World War, but that we rather have this uh, dominant mainstream uh, ideas that are kind of being, you know, raised this pathological level of normalcy with these identitarian questions and so on and so forth, which is just a question to be raised. A thing that I think uh, we should also think about when we think about populism is this pool of potential, because we should not um, kind of disregard this idea that uh, this is uh, like, for example, like Benjamin Arditi, the Mexican political theorist, says that uh, populism behaves like a drunken guest at a dinner party. It doesn't respect the rules of the public contestation or the etiquette, but spells out the painful and real problems of society. So I think that what we have been witnessing uh, in the recent decades in politics is this decentering of politics, where we seem to have this world uh, dominated by the logics of economics and in existence of real alternatives where all parties seem to appear to offer the same solution, where they are just going to manage the economics itself. They do not offer this uh, idea of any kind of credible future projects, and so on and uh, so forth. So when we think about uh, uh, basic the ideas that happened in Italy uh, with uh, appointments of Mario Monti, or the idea by, by uh, German Foreign Minister Schulbe that, uh, there, that there was proposal that the Greeks should be ruled by the technocrats uh, instead of having a free, major, a free will of the people implemented, is some things that we should be concerned about and that we should think that maybe the populism is not so anti-democratic, but of course it seems to appear that populism comes out as very anti-liberal. Or as Mude would say, it's basically unliberal or illiberal democratic response to uh, undemocratic liberalism. And this is basically uh, what I seem to be thinking about, because if we want to overcome some problems, we cannot just uh, disregard these anxieties that do seem to exist in society as basically meaning with people that their ideas are not respected, but we have this uh, government of technicos, which basically happened during the neoliberal prolongations of the 90s in many Latin American uh, countries and so on. So very shortly, uh, I will just mention two, three, or three things without going into deeply into them, that we also need to think about the forms of citizenship. So what is the EU citizenship? Basically, do we just have passports or can we influence what the policies made in the EU institutions, which seems to be important? The second one is that uh, we also have to think about this non-voter party, because in countries like Slovenia or Croatia, when there's votes for the parliamentary uh, European elections, there's uh, the 20 or 30 percent of people go out to vote, which seems to be a problem. And also, when we think about populism, we cannot always uh, identify it as uh, oppressive or exclusive because populism can differ itself and it just depends on whom it does exclude. Um, and it's, it's directed against whom. So we have different types of populism as well. And just uh, final thoughts is because now we have a rise of populism, but again, I'm very... Uh, 
uncertain whether these populists will be resolving these problems uh, which they promised to, uh, to resolve. So what happens when populists basically come to power, stay in for a long time, and basically fail to deliver on their promises? What's going to happen after this? And also, uh, I think this is where I'm going to end. Okay, so thank you very much. So <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this uh, roundtable. My name is Dimitar Nikolovsky. I'm a permanent research fellow here at IASC. Uh, I have two points to make. The first one is uh, inspired by the discussions in the first panel, and this is about the role of scientists and academics uh, in uh, the problems that we are facing today. And what I was thinking of is I tried to remember and to do a mapping of the discussions that we have had in IASC in the last three years, especially with regards to democracy and the quality of democracy. And what I see is three overriding streams or approaches to what is going on. So the first one, uh, which is our favorite, I would say here, is just Brussels bashing. So we talk about how uh, of all the mistakes that the EU has done, of all the hypocrisy of the leaders in Brussels, uh, as well uh, about the failure of liberal elites in Central Europe, especially in the 90s and the early 2000s, and of course criticism of neoliberal politics. Uh, second one, which is in a mi minority, is the Orban and Kaczynski bashers. And those, uh, those people, uh, so man many of us uh, uh, here, are saying, you know, the, the usual shtick. Uh, we criticize uh, Hungary and Poland or Central Europe for diminishing democracy. Uh, they are autocrats, they do not follow European values, even though it's not really clear what European values are, whether they are different from just simply liberal democratic values. And this is where both streams stop. They don't address the other issues. And a clear, very uh, clear minority of academics who are following a certain stream here are those who are combining the two. Usually they're just passers-by or people that we see, see on a screen through Skype. And these are the people who are uh, analyzing the problem saying, yes, liberal elites of the 90s had of serious failures and also the EU has serious failures, but we are facing serious, serious problems with democracy right now here. Something that we do not discuss enough in, uh, uh, in, in IASC. Uh, and uh, when we are discussing about leaving uh, the ivory towers of academics, like we were uh, talking in the first uh, panel, what we are missing, all of us here, is courage to actually leave the safety of the cliques we are part of. And that is how we might contribute to uh, improving democracy or helping democracy of the future. So this is my first point. The second point is about populism from below and how you create populism from below. Uh, uh, and uh, this is about a, one crucial factor for me is the dissemination of information. And uh, I'm coming from uh, Macedonia. I'm not going to address the most obvious contemporary issue why Macedonia is now famous in media, especially in Hungary, but uh, I will take a few years back uh, about the um, uh, presidential elections uh, in the US when a mid-sized city in my country was proclaimed the, capital of, uh, the world capital of fake news. I read an interview with uh, uh, the owner of the biggest number of these websites and uh, the creator of the biggest number of uh, content of these websites. And what he says is, first we tried with uh, uh, websites uh, um, that were speaking of healthy food, exercise, automobiles, didn't work, wasn't profitable. Then we started to enter politics. We first tried, when we entered politics, to uh, create content aimed at liberal audiences. It didn't work, it was not profitable. Only when we started to enter uh, into uh, content of, uh, aimed at conservative US is when we started making real money. So what for me is a very interesting research question is why is it so? Why was it profitable for creators of fake news 
uh, only when they turned towards, uh, uh, for, towards the radical uh, populist uh, right. And of course, the answer cannot be so simple as liberals are smart and conservatives are stupid. It has to be something more than that. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, permit me, as I was also asked to participate in the discussion, to say just uh, a very few sentences, but from a methodological point of view. There were a number of general statements in the discussion, whether, for example, our age is the age of non-cooperation, or according to another type of argumentation, it is cooperation, but it's even more uh, evolutionary, predetermined cooperation. As I am a historian, I have a completely different methodological approach. Because uh, as a historian, one has to be a little bit worried about the use of too many abstract concepts and too many generalizations. Let me give just perhaps one or two examples. We have, can have endless discussions about the uh, authoritarian or non-authoritarian or liberal or non-liberal character of the dual Habsburg monarchy between 1867 and 1918. But if you look at the history of the Habsburg monarchy in detail, there are huge differences among the various provinces of the Habsburg monarchy. So from a historian's point of view, the situation is a bit different because in an authoritarian, in a state in a country that on the level of uh, political science analysis or sociological analysis you describe as authoritarian, you can find a great number of very well-functioning democratic communities that can take care of themselves in a very, very democratic way. And you can also find, so to say, democratic societies where you can find local communities which are terribly authoritarian. So a historian's analysis is a little bit different. And uh, I just uh, would like to emphasize that I am absolutely for interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches, but that shouldn't blur the borderlines among disciplines. Rather, the task is to communicate so that we can come, we can come up with some results of our discipline and we share it with the results of another discipline. But it doesn't mean that it's a kind of a, a mixture of, uh, of interdisciplinarity shouldn't uh, mean the mixture of a great number of disciplines and uh, having uh, analytical approaches on a far too abstract level. But that is just, I do not want to take up too much time. And let us <coughs> open up the discussion. Perhaps we might first ask those who have already presented whether at this point they would like to contribute. Would you like, Professor Offer? Would you like? Yes, to, yes. yes. Okay. I think this one is bigger. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, a number of uh, remarks to uh, uh, on, on populism. Um, uh, it is right, populism is not new, uh, but uh, to put it in the same bag as uh, Venezuela or the historical examples of Peron or uh, Argentina, uh, does not uh, yield much uh, uh, insight, I think. It's very different. One thing is uh, Latin American populists used to describe themselves as populists. None of the European refers to themselves as populist. It's always an outsider who refers to them as, uh, as popular. Important uh, difference. Also, what is missing in the Latin American examples uh, is uh, the uh, identitarian ethnic uh, elements, uh, which are dominant in Europe. Therefore, my two front lines, anti-establishment, and anti-outsiders, uh, which is characteristic. And that is fairly new, with the exception of, uh, of France and the Front National. Uh, I think uh, it is a matter of the uh, past uh, 10 years. And that co coincides with two things, which are important for the uh, analysis of the phenomenon. Stop me if I'm going too long, but uh, let me, <laughs> let me uh, uh, point out one thing. The, the massive evidence, uh, widely perceived state failure in coping with the economic uh, crisis, and the consequence of this crisis, namely 
uh, growing uh, insecurity, inequality, and precariousness. This is not just the fact, it is the fear of facts that plays a bit a uh, role. The, so the mood is much worse than the actual situation, but people fear that the uh, actual situation will uh, develop according to their uh, fears without the state being a reliable force of uh, uh, protection and opportunity. Uh, and that is one, one thing, the, the crisis context. The other thing is, <coughs> which also uh, needs to be analyzed in the same context, the massive uh, decline of social democracy. The social democracy does not exist anymore. Uh, in uh, uh, Virtually does not exist anymore in countries like the Netherlands, like uh, France. Uh, and... Uh, it is 14% now behind the AFD in Germany. I mean, this is unheard of. This has never happened in the history of uh, social democracy. And to go on one, one more step, um, people uh, are complaining about social democracy. Former voters of social democracy are complaining about, we do not know what social democracy stands for. The problem is still worse. We do not know what it stands against. It is the, the loss of a uh, opponent. Uh, I mean, it used to be capitalism, or uh, it is. Uh, it's not uh, present. To conclude, uh, I very much agree uh, that populism should not be equated, as some people. Um, uh, have uh, done in an irresponsible way almost uh, with fascism. The, the main difference is being uh, that uh, populists, all these movements and parties that we see uh, uh, in uh, Europe, um, are not warmongering. No international war, as in the interlude, in the, in the long break of the 31 years war, uh, the first half of the 20th century. Uh, all of, uh, fascism and proto-fascism was internationally aggressive. That is not the case. The second difference is they do not formally abolish uh, party competition while they're making great uh, difficulties for oppo opposition parties actually to compete, right? Uh, and uh, that is... Uh, Okay, let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I think one important topic for discussion might be to what extent the traditional political parties are preconditions of a functioning democracy. So because maybe there will be others, I, as Bitcoin is a new kind of currency, maybe politics will also... <laughs> political Bitcoin, yes. Would you like to? Okay. Let me point out some of the difficulties uh, that we are facing in a uh, facing a uh, problem uh, like this. I mean, I tried to hint that uh, possibly the word democracy is a, a problem in itself because um, democracy is a technical way of how to run a, a state. It is very um, different uh, definitions over time. I think uh, your definition was that of regime. Um, democracy was equated as a form of government, uh, sometimes even a form of state. But um, Essentially, if we look at the history uh, of, of uh, how we arrived at uh, the notion of democracy, that, uh, of liberal democracy um, in the post-Second World War period, there was a, an interruption, uh, industrial revolution, and then Napoleonic Wars and, and, and all that, but essentially in the 18th century and the pre preceding centuries, there was a long search for, in fact, uh, 
uh, for uh, autonomy and, and uh, freedom of the individual. Uh, we have uh, forgotten the importance of uh, the value of freedom and uh, gone into a uh, more of an analytic frame in terms of a democracy, party competition, and so on and so forth, but the essential normative uh, values, if uh, they get submerged somehow um, and, uh, and um, uh, attention is detracted from them. That is one. And then um, two, as a factor that reinforces this, is uh, the semantic problems. I, I will not go through all the semantic problems, but I mean, we talk about liberalism, liberal. Liberal means something west of the Atlantic. It means something else east of the Atlantic. Uh, Who is a liberal and what is a neoliberal? I mean, it rings a, uh, a bell of uh, uh, liberalism and so on and so forth, but, uh, but they, they are very different uh, concepts from uh, one another. Um, the uh, notion of elite, for example, I think in a lot of cases now we're talking about non-elite. I would say we're talking about political non-elite. We're talking about uh, different kinds of non-elite, and we call them elite because, you know, they uh, sit in a parliament or they sit in a ministry, uh, but they do not have the wherewithal of uh, being an elite. And this is, I think, very important to understand this. Um, uh, one has to uh, take into consideration how do you educate and socialize an elite so that they can fulfill uh, a political function with integrity. And that brings me to education. Uh, educational freedom, educational institutions. I mean, uh, this freedom, uh, a social compact, which is now two, uh, two centuries back, so maybe we should call it a political compact for the future. Um, we need a political compact, and, and uh, that certainly needs uh, not a technical education, but an education that encompasses um, some uh, sort of understanding of human, humans and their environment, and particularly what integrity means. And we have uh, courses now, which uh, I have opposed uh, the time of, uh, I, I was the founding dean, of, of um, uh, law and ethics. You do not teach law and ethics if they're going to look at some books and then pass an examination. Ethics is gained, actually, through the reading of classics and important things so that, that you internalize some notion and then you know for yourself as you mature, graduate and then come to become a professional and so on, you go back to them and I said, well, you know, um, what was the meaning of all that that I read? Uh, what was the meaning of uh, uh, social bonds in the French novel versus earlier uh, literature. Um, and finally, we also uh, have uh, had in, among political scientists, uh, largely uh, and on the university campuses, uh, not a mistake, but a certain worldview, of course, uh, every age has a worldview, and one shares that. So the intellectual products of that particular time uh, are informed by a certain worldview. This is normal. This is normal. So, but um, in, we indexed our hopes to improvement through democratic rights expanding democratic rights 
in the post-war era, in the West at least. And, uh, and um, so political culture, for example, was taken up in the 60s, uh, essentially as a function of modernization. It was a huge modernization project at Princeton uh, in the 60s that, you know, communications uh, and modernization and, and so on and so forth. Nothing wrong with that, but that became a part of our lore. And then in the 70s, then there was this transition project and everybody uh, uh, actually internalized this transition project without really reading the full title of, the, of those four volumes. The title was Transition from Authoritarianism. And it is remembered wrongly as transition to democracy. That is not what happened. That might have happened to Gre in Greece, but that was not the general thing. The intellectual intent behind that and the thing with the, there was a transition from authoritarianism, but the project did not describe that as a transition toward uh, democracy. So we have all these complexities, but I come back to two things that are essentially important, that um, education in the medium, you cannot uh, have education producing anything fast. But we have to take the role and the input of education, very important if we want to have a, a better future. Um, that is, uh, I think, essential. And along with that, a decoupling of the idea of elite, the notion of elite, from people who hold political and edu or economic power by being catapulted to the positions they they do not have the makings of an elite and that's part of the problem now thank you very much before i hand over to atarko uh, let, let me just a uh, very few comments uh, what came to my mind while listening to you was the unfortunately early diseased hungarian historian Janu Such who in the early 80s wrote a very interesting and very influential essay about the three historical regions of Europe. And in the first long footnote uh, to this essay, he also writes about democracy. And uh, democracy, he describes, of course, this is early 80s Hungary, is like a ball pen. So it's a technical issue, it's something technical, so that for example, the ball pen, you can write an authoritarian text and you can write a democratic text, so it's a tool. So this is one possible interpretation of democracy. So democracy might have a technical interpretation and ideological interpretation. Maybe during the interwar period uh, in international politics, hear about the cooperation of all democratic forces against fascism, this has a clear uh, ideological message. But if we today speak about various forms of democracy, sometimes it is used with an ideological content, sometimes it is used without an ideological content. So this might be also an interesting topic for discussion. But that's Thank you. Well, sorry. Yes. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Obviously, I have a very different approach to these things. It's actually, we're in a very privileged position that we can sit here and debate these things. And I think that's uh, where the role of academia really comes out. I, in my day-to-day -day life, I don't have the time or the privilege, I call it, to sit and think about these bigger issues. I have a day job. Um, but it is important. And where I live in Hong Kong, it's very obvious that it's the universities that are still the sort of the beacon of discourse on, on these issues. No one really in the wider economy discusses issues of democracy. Um, 
coming from the commercial sector, I, I, I obviously think that it all comes down, is it Bill Clinton has said, it's the economy, stupid. Um, so issues like Brexit, to me, are all about economy and fear, not about wider discussions of populism and democracy and what it means. Um, similarly with what we saw in Hong Kong during the umbrella movement, I think there was a lot of discussion about what that meant and, and that it was a movement for democracy. It was and it wasn't. At the end of the day, a lot of it was about people being afraid. Um, they were afraid of the absolutely shocking income inequality in Hong Kong. People can't afford housing. It's the most expensive housing market in the world. The fear of the, what they call the locusts from the north of the border coming over. So the fear of the mainlanders taking over every aspect of life in Hong Kong. Um, rather than, or supplanted to the sort of democracy movement or the, 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 the young people coming out and demanding more of a say. But, so my, my viewpoint is, is, is more of a, a practical one as to, well, yes, let, let's walk through the, 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 the treacle of the theoretical discussion and, and why are people out on the street. And then I wanted to pick up one point from this morning, nothing to do with, with this panel, about um, the role of, 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 of science in, in educating people and why can't scientists tell people what it is that they're working on. And it's really interesting, uh, we had the discussion about education and how, how can we change the education from an early age to make the communication a lot better. So my daughter, who's almost nine, she's had to stand up in front of her whole class and explain things in an age-appropriate way from the day she started school, age four. Now, I think that's, uh, she's in the British system in Hong Kong, um, and that's, I think, one of the huge advantages of that type of education and something that the people here who are in, in, in the education sector, I think, is just food for thought. Um, because those kids may become scientists or lawyers or any sector, but what they will be able to do is just to communicate their ideas because they've had to do it from a very early age. So just something to think about. Thank you very much. I think at this point we can open up for discussion, so whoever would like to contribute. Yes, go ahead. I'm just worried we're going to break every glass on the table at some point. Um, I, I, I think, you know, it, uh, first of all, you're right. It, it is a privilege and the opportunity to be able to uh, reflect on the variety of issues that are being put on the table in this context is important. But I think there are a couple of thoughts around that that are worth uh, referencing in terms of what people have said already. Firstly, Attila's point, which I thought was very important, um, suggested, and you used a reference point, 1860s to 1918 in terms of the Habsburgs, but what you were really pointing out was that context is determined. It's not, in a certain sense, the philosophical frame, whether that be political, philosophical, or ethical, it is that in the context. And that, I think, was the point that you were making in respect of the historicity, if you will, of populism. And then, put, you didn't mention Podemos, but Podemos and Sritze on one side of the equation, Front National, Liga Norte, and many others within this phenomenon, as well as manifestations of related phenomena, not identical, as, as Klaus pointed out very clearly, that have manifested at different times, not least in Latin America, but in other parts of the world as well. So the generalization, the meta-narrative, in a certain sense, requires to be interrogated in context. Um, it's perfectly clear that uh, Pasok and Sritzia are driven by different logics to the logic that gave us Liga Norte, right? It's perfectly clear that what we are seeing in the context of France with Front National probably wouldn't have happened without Algeria and the Pied Noir. And you can take hundreds of examples of the same logic. Now that takes me to where Demita was in terms of this, which is that 
the easiest way of having these discussions is to feed one's prejudices with what one knows, rather than trying to get to grips with the whole in context. And I'm going to pull your leg off, because I, you're, you don't do that, but I'm going to pull your leg in respect of this. You took Plato through Burke. You would have got a different logic if you started with Aristotle and ended with Bentham and, and John Stuart Mill. So, um, <laughs> so I, I, I'm just showing the relevance of context in all of these discussions, and that raises fundamental questions about what we can generalize about. And none of that detracts from what I thought was a truly scholarly um, account, and I'd really like to read the whole paper that the class presented at the beginning of, of all of this. But the fundamental question is, what purpose does this serve in society? Because if we cut back to the practical in terms of all of this, the logic of both the economy and the polity must be, presumably, the social well-being. It must be the well-being of the population of the entity. If it serves that purpose, then we should adjudge it. I'm not going into utilitarianism directly, but we should adjudge it as a positive. If it doesn't serve that purpose, then we have to be skeptical and critical about it if we're taking an objective position. If we're taking a a subjective position, then our prejudices will determine what we think is good and what we don't think is good. And the one thing that seems clear about the present moment is that the institutional contexts in which governance, which requires capability, requires effectiveness, and requires legitimacy in order to survive, the institutional contexts have undermined all of those things. So there is, there is a generalized frame on quite a large scale, whether it's your accurate description of Hong Kong, or whether it's your description of Brexit, or whether it's what we have experienced in continental Europe in respect of this, whether what we're now seeing in Brazil, you can keep on going. There's a generalized sense across there that the institutions of the state are not meeting the expectations of the demos. And to the extent that that is so, you will get what Klaus is describing as anti-establishment and anti-outsider phenomena, particularly in circumstances where national identity or subnational identity is at stake. So the challenge, it seems to me right now, if one is to stop the rot and not allow, I agree with Klaus, what is not incipient fascism now to turn into something that is more potent and more dangerous in the context of the technological and social transformation on which we are just the edge at this moment. If we're going to prevent that happening, we have to find ways to restore the capacity of political institutions to be seen by electorates to be serving their well-being. If we can't do that, then we know the story. We know potentially where it goes. It's easy to stoke fear based on identity. Right? We saw that in the 30s. We don't want to see it again. But that requires capacity, effectiveness, and legitimacy. And figuring out how we generate and create and sustain that is, I think, perhaps the challenge of the moment. Any further comments? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Sorry, can't resist a couple of comments here. Um, one, maybe just very basically, that there, I, I think uh, Professor Avin made the point about reading the classics and the ethics. My feeling is we're too late if that's the way we gain it. I think, again, we really need it by way of example and the way that children from early on see the practical meaning of empathy and engagement with others in collaboration. I don't disagree about the, the classics, 
by any means, and especially having spent enough time at University of Chicago and Mortimer Adler, et cetera, um, I would be uh, um, dishonest if I said that wasn't important. But I think that one actually needs to think more about how we instantiate that at other stages of life and make that a coherent experience, if you will. Second point that I wanted to raise, which was uh, just a, a response, um, and I believe that it, uh, uh, that you at uh, Tilla uh, mentioned the um, that that you thought that the um, what was it um, that the you you were if I understood it right you were talking about the sort of the homogenization of different disciplines as if I interpreted that correctly. I think the issue is not the separate domains, but the really tough challenge of finding a way of establishing common shared meaning in across disciplines. I led a project for four years, it's still going on, but I don't have time to work on it, sadly, though I miss it, on the Arctic and on decision making in Arctic communities, particularly in Western Siberia and in Greenland. And the issue was, we ha in, in my team, I had two lawyers, four natural scientists doing modeling, political scientist, sociologist, and an economist. I may have left somebody out, but okay. Um, the difficulties of actually talking to each other were horrendous. And I mean, I was as guilty of it as anyone. I mean, I ran a company for 20 years and dealt with intellectual property, had a fantastic lawyer who worked with me, and thought, oh, okay, I kind of get what law is about. Well, um, Bridget very quickly, who is an expert in international cross-boundary air pollution law, um, put me on the floor in about two seconds when I realized I don't have a clue what she's, the basis of what she's thinking on these issues. And it took us, and I, I actually made an explicit effort to document this process. And so I just raise this as a point that this is a, a, a process I think we really need to engage in across these disciplines, because otherwise we don't have the means to deal with these kinds of complex and clearly fundamentally interdisciplinary issues. Uh, <coughs> respond uh, to this, I think it's, it's very, very important because it's an obvious experience that we have to try to analyze more recent phenomena on the basis of previously established conceptual frameworks. And uh, therefore, when we are having discussions, and sometimes the discussions uh, lead to violent clashes, the main reason for the discussion is that we really do not fully understand the meaning of our partner who is using a concept in a completely different meaning. I think everyone might have attended meetings where this was taking place. It comes to a violent exchange and ultimately when you cool down, it turns out that basically they are saying the same, the same thing. So, and also in education, the, clarify, the clarification of concepts is very, very important. Just a footnote to this, uh, Education. My experience with American students is, I was teaching for a relatively long time American students, is that they are extremely good at writing. They write fantastic essays, but I had graduate seminars when I asked the student to summarize the substance of a reading or in five minutes, and he or she was at a loss. Because at the age of 20, 21, 22, they didn't have oral experiences. So I think in the American system, but maybe I had a false student, uh, this is, there's too much emphasis on writing and limited emphasis on, uh, on oral exchanges. You wanted to say anything? Yes, go ahead, yes. Um, hello, um, 
My name is uh, Jan Harvat. I'm from uh, CU uh, Sastra, uh, but I'm from the Department of History. And uh, I would like to speak about one thing that was said here before, that uh, competition is a double-edged sword. And I would like to build up on that, that it is not the only double-edged sword. Because uh, in regards to competition being the double-edged sword, we mean, or it was meant, that it is not only uh, good, it is not a value for its own sake. But uh, uh, we also heard uh, some notions about fear, and fear usually has this very negative connotation. Yet at the same time as fear is this uh, motivating factor, it can also have a very positive connotation. And we usually like never really realize this, because instead of using the word fear, we just uh, say race awareness, race concern about something. And I believe that this is going to be an issue that is going to be raised by many speakers tomorrow, or at least uh, like one speaker tomorrow, uh, concerning uh, like uh, environmental policies and, and what is to come regarding uh, global warming, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, to connect this to the previous panel and uh, the panel on innovation and how the millennials can perceive uh, the issues at hand, uh, I believe that uh, they either already fear or they already are concerned with many uh, things that uh, uh, will take place and uh, why they are concerned and why things are changing the way they are, do they are changing right now. I think that we should look to the classics or at least to political theologies of the era of the classics uh, because it is known for time immemorial that uh, crisis always raises this change of ideas and a change of thinking about the entire structure. And the structure can change only within the crisis. And the crisis is really coming. And we can do virtually nothing to prevent it. So the crisis that is going to come that we may now, now fear, I think that <clears throat> the way is not to fear the crisis, fear this uh, global warming phenomena, but to fear what is going to come after the crisis. And now the time is not to prepare for the crisis, but rather to prepare for the time after whatever it is that is going to happen. Uh, and my question would be how to do that, how to include this into the education that we were speaking so much about. How to prepare not for people fearing, but rather how to make the people fear what is going to come after what we fear. Thank you. Uh, fearful, you know, so whatever you are saying. Okay, any more comments? So let us exploit our privileged position of having the opportunity to discuss these things in this wonderful environment where we do not have to be afraid of anything for the time being. <laughs> 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 Well, can we? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. It's truly important that when one's thinking about communication, and I think that was the thrust of what you were speaking to, um, one really needs to understand how humans function. And I, I, I don't want to get into the neurochemistry here. There are people in the room better qualified than I am in any event. But on the simplest level, we're driven preeminently by, by three systems, all of us, everyone in this room, everyone outside of this room. Different balances, different contexts, different circumstances. But the first reason that we've survived as a species is because of what you can generalize as the amygdala effect. If I see something in my peripheral vision, it might be that lamp falling on me, but if I see something in my peripheral vision, then I will respond. And I'm equipped in terms of what then happens in my neural systems for fear, flight, or play dead. And I can, certain things will enable me to be able to do that with extraordinary strength for at least for limited periods or to conceal myself for an extended period. You can think of a cockroach or you can think of you. It doesn't really matter very much. That's how species survive. It's a significant survival mechanism. The second thing is, is want. Right? Species cannot survive without some form of procreation, even if they are unisexual. 
Right? So there are mechanisms that enable that. And if I can use a very crude system, a very crude analogy, squirrels collect nuts before the winter and hide them so that the absence of nuts does not cause them to die. So if you like, within that dopamine system, the two most startling illustrations are lust, hence procreation in terms of humans, and, and, uh, and greed, accumulation, excessive accumulation, accumulation of more than you need. So now you've got fear and greed. But then, thank God, we also have something that is the product of oxytocin, and that is social empathy. The archetype is the mother in terms of oxytocin released when the child is at her breast. That's the archetype of social empathy. It is the premise on which much of our system is built. Males have to th see things like sunsets over, the, over a calm sea or something like that to get a significant degree of oxytocin release. But that balance, if you think about it, that balance between fear, want, and empathy is what enables human homeostasis. And one can extrapolate back into the well-being frame that we were talking about earlier in terms of a similar set of preconditions for homeostasis on a social level. There has to be a significant degree of individual freedom because otherwise creativity and innovation doesn't exist. But there has to be a sense of social obligation to community because otherwise society cannot survive. And we would recognize today that we have to be respectful of the reality that we depend on the ecological context in which the human species function. So respect for the environment, if you want shorthand for it, is the third dimension of the survival of societies and communities. We don't have that balance today. Our social systems and our economic systems have distorted that balance in very, very dangerous ways. And therefore, we should be fearful of it. But everyone is fearful in their own way. This is the, in a certain perverse sense, the first sentence of Anna Karenina. Right? So, so what one has to recognize is we have to get back into an appropriate condition of equilibrium. You cannot survive as an individual if you do not have an appropriate homeostasis in the first instance. And societies cannot survive functionally if they are not in balance. So that, it seems to me, is the challenge. And that's why the diagnostic of what is causing the pathology that we can see on multiple levels, both within societies, on larger scales regionally and globally, and vis-a-vis -vis the environment, is so central in terms of analysis today. Thank you very much. May I just ask if there is there any more comments from the audience or members of the panel? Would you like to have some concluding remarks? If that is not the case, <laughs> then all we have left is to thank all the participants, the active participants, the passive participants, all the participants uh, <laughs> for attending this, uh, the first day of this conference.